those who participate in the music ministry. Uh, let me encourage you, invite your, uh, let me invite you to turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2, we're continuing our, our Bible study through the Gospel of Luke. This morning's sermon title is Growing Up as the Son of God. Growing Up as the Son of God, Luke 2 verse 40. <clears throat> uh, Samuel Taylor Coleridge was an English poet. He was a literary critic. He was a philosopher. He was a theologian. And Coleridge was once talking with a man who told him that he did not believe in giving little children any religious instruction whatsoever. His theory was that the child's mind should not be prejudiced in any direction, but when he came to the years of discretion and understanding, he should be permitted to choose his religious opinions for himself. So Coleridge said nothing. But after a while, he asked his visitor if uh, he would like to see his garden. The man said he would. And so Coleridge took him out into the garden where only weeds were growing. The man looked at Coleridge in surprise and said, Why, this is not a garden. This is nothing but weeds here. Well, you see, answered Coleridge, I did not wish to infringe upon the liberty of the garden in any way. I was just giving the garden a chance to express itself and to choose its own production. You know, that was Coleridge's, you know, sarcastic way of saying, look, you need to give children spiritual instruction. Children need to grow up and they need spiritual influence or else weeds will just grow. Do you remember growing up? Do you remember your childhood? Do you remember the lessons that you learned? Do you remember the, the growing pains that you, that you went through? But you went through it, and you grew up. You know, we have four girls and a boy. The sequence goes like this, girl, 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 boy, girl. And um, just thinking about my own growing up, and then I thought about my children's growing up. And I remember some hu humorous observations of our children growing up. You know, uh, when we turned on the vacuum cleaner, you know, initially the girls were always scared. You know, they were always afraid, initially. But when we had the boy, he wanted to ride the vacuum cleaner. It was a little different in, in raising uh, children. I remember one time hitting the garage door opener and seeing my four-year-old son rise with the garage door, and I'm thinking, what are you doing? You know? And I'm thinking, I wonder how much weight that door can hold, <laughs> you know, if I could try it. But, you know, children growing up, it was different. I remember the girls, when they were really young, when we were out and about, the, the girls would tend to stay close to us. But the boy, we had to keep on a leash, <laughs> you know. Um, I remember taking our children with their cousins and aunts and uncles. We had, I don't know, 14, 15 cousins, uh, four or five aunts and uncles uh, at, a, at a major zoo, Brookfield Zoo in the Chicagoland area. And uh, we would go from one exhibit to another, and all of a sudden, our boy was missing. And uh, you know the panic that sets in when a child is missing. So we had the uncles... One aunt in charge of all the 13, 14 kids, and then the aunts and uncles are going and looking for the kid. I see a park ranger. I say, hey, listen, we're missing a boy. He's about four or five years old, um, white, male, Caucasian boy, brown hair, brown, brown eyes with the Spider-Man T-shirt. And, you know, that rounded it down to half of the kids in, in, in the zoo at the time. But eventually he was found. But it was a scare for us. You know, it's a scare for all parents when your kids go missing. So in our text this morning, Mary and Joseph's boy will go missing for three days. In our text, we'll see the growing up of the Son of God. Jesus was an infant, he was a child, and he would become a young man. Jesus was fully human. As one music artist said or sung years ago, and this baby grew into a young boy who learned to read and write and wrestle with dad. There was the climbing of trees and the scraping of knees and all the fun that a boy's born to have. He grew up. He was fully human. And at the same time, he was fully God. 
Luke 2.52 describes Jesus' growing up in four areas, mental, physical, spiritual, and social. He continued to develop his, his knowledge of things. He grew in his physical body. He developed his spiritual awareness. Uh, he developed in his social relationships. And his development in these four areas was perfect. He was a boy, yet he was perfect and without sin. He was different. But let's begin in Luke chapter 2, verse 40. There are not too many texts that describe the, the growth of the Son of God, the, the boyhood of Jesus. Only about three verses, and Luke covers them here. So Luke chapter 2, verse 40, we'll read to verse 50 at this point. He says, <clears throat> and this is after uh, they took him home from the presentation in the temple where Simeon and Anna saw him, okay, from last week. And the child grew and waxed strong in spirit, filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. Now his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the Feast of Passover. And when he was 12 years old, they went up to Jerusalem after the custom of the feast. And when they had fulfilled the days, as they returned, the child Jesus tarried behind in Jerusalem. And Joseph and Mary, or Joseph and his mother, knew not. But they, supposing him to have been in the company, went a day's journey. And they sought him among their kinsfolk and acquaintance. And when they found him not, they turned back again to Jerusalem, seeking him. And it came to pass that after three days they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the doctors, both hearing them and asking them questions. And all that heard him were astonished at his understanding and answers. And when they saw him, they were amazed. And his mother said unto him, Son, why hast thou dealt with us thus? Behold, thy father and I have sought thee sorrowing. And he said unto them, How is it that you sought me? Wist ye not that I must be about my father's business? And they understood not the saying which he spoke unto them. So here we have the young Jesus in the temple. Verse 41 says, His parents went to Jerusalem every year according to the, the feast of the Passover. What, that's the occasion here. That's the setting. Okay, Jesus attends the Passover with his parents. And, and, and as we just read here, his parents made it a priority to observe what God told them to observe, to obey and, and, and observe the re religious holiday of Passover. If you don't know, remember what Passover was, it comes from Exodus chapter 12 where Jewish families who were in bondage in Egypt at the time had to sacrifice a lamb and place that blood on the doorposts. And they also ate unleavened bread in hasty preparation for their freedom for the exodus. They were about to exit that slavery in, in, in Egypt. And those who observed the ritual were the ones that the death angel would pass over the judgment, sparing them from the judgment that befell the firstborn of the Egyptians. So Luke here gives this story about Jesus' childhood. And Joseph and Mary were devout Jews. They, they instructed him. They didn't take a neutral stance about spiritual instruction. They intended, they purposed in their hearts to know the law of the Lord and to do it. They were God-fearing folks. They were people of the book. Okay? They knew the law of the Lord. They embraced it and they did it. So they, they taught him the importance of this holiday. You know, three times a year, Jewish men were, re were required, they were commanded to go and observe this religious holiday. But not all of them could go or not all of them could afford to do so. But if they cho chose one out of the three feasts, they would choose this one, the most important, the Passover. And so we have this Passover holiday. It's almost you know, similar to what we would call our Thanksgiving. But this was a festive occasion. It was the most important feast on the Jewish calendar. And people traveled in caravans with family, with villages. They, they, women and children would lead the way. And the men and the, and the young men would follow behind and the women and children would set the pace because they would go a little slower and they, they would go as groups, they would grow, go as families and parts of their village for safety, for protection from highwaymen, from robbers on the road. And they would watch each other's children. If you go back to verse uh, 41 there, or verse 40, it says, And the child grew. The word child there describes children from infants, toddlers, all the way to the age of 12, but not 13. The age of 13, a Jewish boy was considered, he would go through a similar modern um, 
what we have is a modern-day bar mitzvah. He would become a son of the law. He would become mature. He would become a man in the eyes of God, in the eyes of culture. Okay? He would become a son of the covenant. He would be responsible for knowing the law and obeying it. It was a rite of passage. So Jesus here is, is 12 years old. He's in between. He could be with the, 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 the women and the children in the, in the group going ahead, or he could be with the, the, the men and the young men, and he could probably go back and forth between them because he's right on the verge of being, becoming a son of the law. So that's why you can imagine where Joseph is thinking, oh, Jesus is with Mary, and Mary's thinking, oh, he's probably with Joseph and the young men as they're leaving. But here it says in verse 40 again that he grew. He continued to grow. The idea is that there's a passive kind of suggestion here where, look, he did what boys do. They get bigger. They grow physically. And so verse 40 says, And the child grew, and he waxed strong in spirit. That's the, that's the picture here. Uh, it was programmed in his DNA. You know, you just have to feed him, and the boy's going to grow. He does, he, you know, physically, that's what's going to happen because that's how God designed it. It was passive for him in that sense. It also says there he grew and waxed strong in spirit, filled with wisdom. That is also a passive suggestion where he was like a cup. He was receiving ins biblical instruction from his parents, but also he was receiving the blessing and the favor of God from his heavenly Father. In fact, this text, uh, out of the text that we'll read today, three times a big deal is made or a focus, uh, an exaggeration uh, is made of Jesus' wisdom. He was more wise than the regular boy. So this is a perfect mixture of his humanity. He grew, he got bigger, but he also grew in wisdom and in God's grace, according to verse 40. Now, if you look at verse 40, 42, when he was 12 years old, they went up to Jerusalem at the custom of the feast. Again, a son of the law he would be. Typically, they would, they would take him to, and just to observe, and they would see some ceremonies where that would happen. And so... Again, Jesus is that pre-adolescent stage, not a teenager, but not necessarily an infant or a toddler or a child. He's, just, he's 12. He's right there. He could have easily gone from either group, from Mary's and the children's to the men and the young men uh, carrying up the rear of the caravan. So when they left, that's probably where Jesus was going from back and forth. But then when they left after the, observing the holiday, we see something happening in verse 43. Let's go, look back down. And when they had fulfilled the days as they returned, the child Jesus tarried behind in Jerusalem, and Joseph and his mother knew not of it. So I want to show you the oversight here. Okay, this is the process where you lose your kid, <laughs> you lose track. Uh, he is accidentally left behind by his parents, but... And some will even suggest, some commentators will even suggest that Jesus unknowingly sinned here. And we know that's not the case. It's not true because the Bible would say over and over again that Jesus knew no sin, he did no sin, and in him was found no sin. He was a perfect human being, a perfect boy. I think the word there, the, the verb tarried behind, gives us that indication. He purposely chose to stay behind. It was intentional and it was purposeful. This was not an accident. Jesus did not just get caught up in the moment. He intended to stay and tarry behind as if to emphasize to his parents his God-appointed role. Look at verse 46. No, verse 44, but when they supposed him to have been in the company, went a day's journey, and they sought him among their kinsfolk and acquaintance, and when they found him not, they turned back again to Jerusalem. So it's a three to four day journey, how they got there, from Galilee to Jerusalem. Now after the observation of the Passover, the holiday, they, they make one day's journey. And as you can imagine, hey, you know, he has four brothers and at least two sisters, and they're doing a head count at the first stop after a first day's journey away from Jerusalem, and they're one head short. Where is he? So they go from group to group, kinsfolk, family members, hey, is Jesus with you? Is Jesus with you? They go to their neighbors and village members. Did you see him? When did you see him last? And so, you know, panic starts to set in, no doubt. 
12-year-old boy. Remember that this road, this Jericho trap road. Remember what happened when Jesus gave the story of the Good Samaritan? The man was walking on this treacherous journey, this, 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 this path, and robbers fell among him, beat him and left him for dead. Traveling in a large group was for safety, and now they're thinking, where is my son? So they're searching. They take another day's journey back to Jerusalem to find him. So that's two days he's missing now. Now look at verse 46. And it came to pass that after three days they found him in the temple sitting in the midst of the doctors, both hearing them and asking them questions. And all that heard him were astonished at his understanding and answers. So after the oversight, they, they, they finally go and search, and here's the outcome. Okay, Jerusalem is 42 square miles. The temple complex is 35 acres. So that third day, they're looking throughout Jerusalem. They're looking in the temple, and finally, they find him. And he's in probably the portico of the temple. The, there was a, you know, covered walkways around and where uh, people would gather and meet and they would hear the, the teaching of Jewish doctors of the law. And they find Jesus there, you know, two days now, gone. And it says there in verse 47, 46 and 47, He's in the midst of the Jewish scholars, both hearing and asking them questions, and they were astonished at his understanding. We are treading on what is, is mysterious ground. Here is the perfect human Jesus coming into an understanding of his identity as the Son of God. You know, all children, all teenagers, all adults have gone through it at one time or another. Who am I? You know, you think, I am my father's son, I am my, father, uh, my mother's son or, 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 or daughter. Um, I am of the house of this, I'm the house of that. And you start realizing who you are. And here, Jesus, before the, the bar mitzvah, so to speak, before the coming of age, he already knew who he, uh, who, who he was. And he was not sinning here. As some would suggest, everyone here in the temple, in that group, they are amazed. The Greek word there means to be beside themselves with amazement. This word, Luke only uses it most of the time. He uses it for when, when, when you come up upon um, something that is supernatural, that is unexplainable, that causes you fear. And so they are astonished. They are amazed. They are beside themselves about the quality of his understanding, the quality of his questions, and of his answers. They are shocked with amazement about his understanding. And no doubt, I think they were probably talking about Passover and what it meant, about the sacrifice. Jesus would come into the understanding at this point in time that he is the Lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world. So even at the age of 12, he's listening and asking questions, and he never grew out of that. Look, if you want to connect with people, if you want to be able to help people, if you want to be able to bring them along in the faith, in understanding of who God is and what they would have him to do or what he would have them to do in life, you're going to have to learn to ask questions. You're going to have to use your ears to understand where people are at so that you can lay them by the hand and bring them where they ought to be. Okay, every one of us from teens to adults here. That is how Jesus did it. He knew that to connect with people's hearts, he had to use his ears. So ask questions, learn answers, and bring people along in the faith. Now look at verse 48. And when they saw him, they were amazed. And his mother said unto him, Son, why hast thou thus dealt with us? Behold, thy father and I have sought thee sorrowing. So here we see now Jesus describing, I am the Messiah in, in essence. I'm the Messianic Son. He knows who He is before the coming of age. Um, he, he is looked upon, you know, at age 13 as a son of the covenant. But even before that, He knew who He was and what God required of Him. We see in verse 48, you know, you can understand this. Literally, Mary says, 
We've been suffering pain looking for you. There were hurt feelings, a touch of ah, relief, but with an edge of rebuke. We have been looking for you, and we have been anxious. We have been in pain. You know, can you, you know let, me, let me run to you, run through you what goes through a parent's mind when a child goes missing, right? Oh, man, did he fall in the rough terrain? Did, did, was he kidnapped to be sold into slavery? Uh, they hoped for the best. They feared the worst. What happens? Right when you know your child is missing, your heart begins to beat. There's palpitations. There's frantic searching and looking. There's a calling out in desperation as you call out your child's name. There is, there is a, your imagination running wild. If we don't find him within 24 hours, we will never find him. And there is panic. And, and just as Mary says, we have been suffering pain looking for you. And you know, you get angry at yourself. You, 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 you feel guilty and you, you feel a bit embarrassed because it was your child. You should have been watching him. And so you can understand the, the tinge of, of rebuke here and relief at the same time. But Jesus, without sin, in verse 49 says, essentially, you should have known that I would have been at my father's house. Mary had said, your father and I, we've been worried sick about you, essentially. But Jesus says, you should have known I would have been in my father's house about my father's business. Again, some think Jesus sinned unknowingly doing this, but that's not the case. Scripture over and over again says he was perfect without sin. I personally think that Jesus was, in a sense, asserting his independence, because he had come to the knowledge that he is the Son of God. Jesus knew who he was and what his heavenly Father required of him. He was, he was calling the temple his Father's house. He was asserting the fact that he stood in a unique relationship to God. No other human being would have this relationship he was saying that this radical understanding, my father's house, implying that he was God's son. Listen, this is a radical understanding, a radical declaration. Out of 39 books of the Old Testament, God is referred to as father only 14 times. And in those 14 times, it was never a direct address like my father. It was the fa God, the father of Israel, or Abraham's father, God. Never did Abraham say my father. But here, Jesus addressed God as my father, and he would address God as my father 60 more, 60 plus times in the Gospels. And imagine, this is the first recorded words of Jesus. You should have known I would be in my father's house and about my father's business. You should have known this. So his bond with his heavenly father, see this, transcended his bond with his humanly family, human family. So he was stating the fact to Mary, I am the son of God. But they misunderstood him, as verse 50 says. They can't comprehend what he's saying. But Mary puts this in the back of her mind, as she always does, meditating on it. But what do we draw from this as, a, as, a, as we're close to closing here? Jesus, Jesus had a family that had the right priorities. Jesus established, lived in a home that had established spiritual priorities. They worshiped God according to what God had said. They put God first in their life so that no other thing could distract them from spiritual truth. He also lived in a family that made it a, a, a priority to participate in spiritual instruction. Grandma and grandpa, whatever influence that you have with grandchildren and children, use it. Exercise spiritual influence. Mom and dad, make it a priority to worship as God instructs us to worship. You can't leave children to themselves or they'll be like a garden of weeds. 
They have to be taught spiritually truth to weed and to plant truth that that truth may grow and bear fruit. Make it a priority to get spiritual instruction. And now look at these last two verses. The last two verses that we'll see that speak in regards to Jesus' manhood. In other words, from the age of 12 to the age of 30, this is all we have. Verse 51 and 52. This is all that it says about who Jesus was as a boy becoming a man, coming into manhood. Look at verse 51. So after, you know, this interchange between Mary, his mother, and, and him saying, listen, I'm the son of God. He knew his position, but he did not argue with his God-given authority parents. In fact, he submitted to them, even though he was the son of God. Look at verse 51. And he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was subject unto them. He submitted unto them. Him being the creator of the world, everything consists because of him and in him and for him and for his glory. He submitted himself to his earthly parents. Was subject unto them, but his mother kept all these sayings in her heart. And it goes on to say, verse 52, And Jesus increased in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man. So here's the young Jesus growing up from the age of 12 to 30. Somewhere between 12 and 30, Joseph, his dad, dies. He's never mentioned after Jesus' public ministry. So Jesus had to take up the, the mantle. He had to take up the leadership of the head of the household, the head of the family business of carpentry and construction. <clears throat> he had to lead the family worship and the spiritual instruction of the family. So while growing up here in Nazareth, Jesus grows in the following areas, in height, physically, maturity, stature, in wisdom, his mental maturity. But the, the key uh, verb in verse 52 is the word increased. It's a different word from the verse 40. In verse 40, before he became 12, it said he grew. Here it says he increased. Grew meant that uh, that's what boys do. It was a passive growing. They just got bigger. Here in verse 52, it says he increased. The word increased means to forge ahead, to cut forward, to advance. So here at the age of 12, Going into 13 and going up to 30, he cut forward. He made a forward progression. He was forging ahead. It was an active role in his participation in his own spiritual growth. He went forward and progressed in maturity, in wisdom. And his wisdom was exceptional in verse 40, in verse 47, in verse 52. Wisdom that was poured upon him from God. He walked with God and received the wisdom of God. In fact, Jesus would uh, comment in, in chapter 11, verse 31, I think. He would say, you know what? The queen of Sheba came to see the most wisest man in the world, King Solomon. And you know what he said at the end of that verse? He said, but a greater than Solomon is here. Jesus was, grew in wisdom wiser than any man ever known. Yet he was subject unto his parents he was, you know, Christian slaves were subject to their masters. Citizens were subject to their government. Wives were subject to their husbands. Children were subject to their parents. So subjection or bringing yourself under the authority of someone that God has placed before you is not a sign of inferiority. It is an admission. It is a, uh, an act of obedience to God. God put mom and dad in your life, young person. So obey honor. God put the government over us. So honor the government unless they tell you to do something contrary to the word of God. If they do that, then you say it's better for us to obey God rather than men. So this is Jesus growing in wisdom, submitting to the authority that was placed in his life. So he grew in height, he grew in wisdom, he grew in favor with God, he walked in fellowship with God in the depends of the Holy Spirit. And you know what his priority was when he found himself to be the Son of God? His priority was God's house, God's work, and God's plan for his life. That's true for all of us. He had a dual relationship. He knew he was a child of God. He was the Son of God, no one like him. But anyone who believes in Jesus Christ have become children of God. We have the relationship with God, but we still have the relationship with men. 
So here it says Jesus grew in favor with God and with men. According to Mark 6, 3, Jesus, you know, typically a Jewish home was a one, big, one big room. He had four brothers. One of them would write the book of James. One of them would write the book of Jude. And he had at least two sisters. So you know <laughs> him being the perfect son, the perfect boy, perfect teen, perfect man. He got along with family. And when he took over the business, he knew how to deal with humanity. He knew customer service. He knew being firm. He knew, being, he, he knew how to run a business. He knew how to honor his mom. But first of all, all that came because he honored his heavenly father. He always sought to do his heavenly father's will. Happy are those children who imitate the example of Jesus. They're obedient to parents. They're self-controlled. They're responsible. And they choose the wisdom of God. But that is also true for every one of us as we seek to know and to love God. We need God's grace to grow in favor with God and man. So here we go. How, what do I take away from this? Listen. Young person, Jesus was perfect, you're not. So how do you handle your parents' relationship? Jesus was perfect, his parents were not. Yet they honored his authority, or their authority. He honored their authority as his parents. So ought we. Understand your position in life. Honor those whose God has placed around you. Your boss, your coworker, your spouse, your neighbor, your government. Honor them. You know, and in the process of growth, parents, it's instituted by God. Children should grow up. You do everything that you can to train them in the way that they should go. And one day, you have to let them go. Let them grow up. And here we have in that last verse a, a picture, a perfect picture of, of a full and a balanced human life. The physical realm, the intellectual realm, the spiritual realm, and the social realm. Whether you're 12 or whether you're 90, a balanced life has a balanced approach to all those categories. Your physical, your spiritual, your social. Where are you at in that? Are you balanced? And lastly, a truly obedient child of God is going to honor his heavenly Father. God's house, God's work, and God's plan should be an important part of every child of God. Are you committed to that? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for the goodness of your grace. We thank you that you fill us with wisdom through your word, through the ministry of the word of God, the spirit of God, through psalms, through hymns, through spiritual songs. Help us as followers of Jesus Christ to commit ourselves to a ba balanced growth in spirit, in mind, in body, and in relationship with God and with men. We need your grace to grow in favor with God and with men. Our vertical and our horizontal relationships, we pray that you would empower us to live out that commandment, that great commandment, to love you with all our soul, with all our heart, with all our mind, and with all our strength. And then the second greatest commandment, to love our neighbors as ourselves. Help us to grow as Jesus grew. For we pray this in Jesus' name. And all of God's people say, Amen. Amen.